You are now accused of uh, painting a more pessimistic uh, picture of Europe, and even though I thought in the beginning that your, uh, when I read your book, I thought that the things that you are proposing are really bold, liberal reforms, and you got like 85%, 90%, 95% agreement, something like that. But um, would you think it's possible? Are you being naive in proposing these things? And what is the greatest obstacle in, in doing some of the reforms that you have the support here? And, uh, and uh, what is the most important change to do? So you could reflect on that and comment on your commentators for the picture that they uh, comment on your comment. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'm delighted to have 85% agreement and 90 or 95% agreement. I mean, uh, in, in politics, that's that's rare, um, and <laughs> therefore I will. Uh, and therefore I will say that the fact that um, the, the comments were focused on the areas of disagreement, uh, you shouldn't take as representative. Clearly, they didn't want to echo the parts they agreed with, and they focused on the bits that they disagreed with. Um, a few points of fact. Of course, if you stretch back far enough, Europe is doing as well as the United States. The fact is, since 1995, productivity growth, which is the basis of higher living standards, had, there's been a divergence between the United States uh, and Europe. Uh, it's been stronger in the US, uh, weaker uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, unless you raise productivity growth, um, you're not going to be able to afford um, higher living standards, especially when the productivity of the people working has to not just pay for the people working, but for ever-rising numbers of people who are retired. And yes, you are right, it's great that you know, people uh, in their 50s who are perfectly able to work are continuing working. In Britain, that because of the crisis, you're seeing even people 65, 70 continuing working, and to a certain extent, that offsets that. Uh, but still, uh, don't be complacent about the challenge ahead. We've only okay. just started. The baby boomers have uh, just started retiring over the past five years. Uh, it's going to be a huge change over the next 15. Uh, and I would respond to those people who say Europe is still wonderful. Yes, I love Europe. I love Europe. I love, that's why I want Europe uh, to be better, and I want us to be able to continue to have a wonderful Europe. It's not by saying, by being complacent and saying, well, it's been wonderful in the past and we're still great now, uh, that you're going to be able to have a, a great Europe uh, in future. Uh, and I think we shouldn't be uh, blasé about uh, the scale uh, of the challenges ahead. And so, when you can point to things which are true, which is, yes, this year is slightly better in the Eurozone than last year, okay, that's true. But you, you look at the big picture, which is that the Eurozone is doing you know, worse than in the 1930s, that the economy is still smaller than eight years ago, and you're saying, actually, you know, the big picture is terrible, and even the longer-term picture, which is not just the crisis, but is the past 20 years, we're also underperforming. So I think we need to be um, much more uh, aware of the challenge ahead. Now, admittedly, you know, Norway is, is in certain, to a certain extent, because of your you know, massive oil reserves, uh, a, a different case. Though I think you should be worried still uh, about um, the low productivity uh, but, in, in, the, in, in this country. Um, but, but said, the low productivity you quoted is due to the decline in oil production, and that's not due to productivity in the, well, the real economy in Norway. It, take away the it, decline in oil, it, productivity it, it, is okay. And, it's due, and, it's due, <laughs> and that, 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 that is your ability to be able to afford the standard of living that you have now. Mm. And, and I think it's manifest, you come to Norway, and you see that there are some sectors which are e efficient, and there are some which are less efficient, and the ones that are less efficient uh, have some catching up to do. And that is true across Europe in every single economy, uh, in, uh, from Britain to Germany and even more so uh, uh, in Greece. So I say the biggest, the biggest obstacle is one, complacency, and two, the huge power of vested interests which want to block change. So you see, why don't we have as dynamic, for example, an internet scene as we do in, in the United States? Well, one reason is we don't have a European single market. So if you, you, you know, in the US, you start a, a startup and suddenly you have a whole US um, market to sell to. In Europe, you only have your local market. But also, you have the big established telecoms companies which want to throttle change because it, it, it threatens their dominant position. Uh, you have difficulties in starting a business and attracting capital. And all those things uh, we shouldn't underestimate. 
Thank you. Uh, even though I haven't asked you to sign up, you have already started signing up, and that's really, really kind. So please do, and uh, people sitting behind here, you can also uh, sign up for questions, and I will take one question at the time and tell you when the list is closed. Uh, before we open, I'd like you to comment on something that's in the papers and in the debate uh, and will not disappear for, I don't think on the short term, maybe not in the long term. You open up for one of the solutions is to take, to say that in the uh, aging population we need migration. And mm -hmm. what we are seeing now is a huge migration that we are really not in a position to tackle for the moment in the Mediterranean. So I'd like the panel to comment on that and uh, you may sign up. So uh, maybe you'll start again, Mr. Legrain, on commenting on the policies for the, uh, I'd say, catastrophe in the Mediterranean right now. Well, I mean, clearly what's happening in the Mediterranean is, is tragic, um, that thousands of people are drowning uh, on uh, Europe's doorstep. Uh, uh, and I think that, at the very least, we need to have an enhanced humanitarian effort um, to uh, save people rather than um, allow them uh, to die. More importantly, though, or more importantly, um, the bigger picture, though, is that the idea that migration is a threat rather than opportunity <coughs> uh, is simply not true. I mean, migrants have a huge amount uh, to contribute uh, to Norway and other European countries, whether it is... Uh, as uh, innovators, as entrepreneurs, as people doing the jobs that local people don't want to do, uh, as uh, taxpayers, as carers, carers for the elderly. Uh, and uh, while you're right to say that part of the solution to demographic uh, change uh, is that people should uh, work longer and you could increase labour market participation, actually some of the countries in Northern Europe that face the biggest challenge actually already have very high levels of female participation, for example. Um, so the idea, you can't get that same benefit that you can elsewhere. Migration is a key um, part uh, of the solution. Not all of the solution, but a key part of the solution. Okay. Andreasen? Well, um, I read your uh, op-ed in the New York Times some few days ago. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> really uh, astonishing to hear such a voice in the European debate. Uh, and and, you, and, you, and you, you wrote about the experience from Israel. Um, how many percent did that population increase? In that it increased by when the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it increased by 15 percent uh, in uh, eight years. Yeah, sure. And it, it has created some problems uh, with the uh, borders of that country versus the neighbors. That must be said still, but. Uh, uh, I think a society is able to, to uh, adapt to a um, much larger change. And to people saying that in Norway, we don't have place for more people. It's filled up. <laughs> Did you look down when you came in? <laughs> it's not, of course. It's, we have plenty of space. But I think the, the, I don't have any answer on that, uh, the, the catastrophe going on in the Mediterranean. And I accept that societies in Europe not today uh, are not able, are not willing, are not willing. <coughs> To, uh, to take on a huge number of refugees. Of course, many of them might be contribute nicely to this, their society, uh, and both in, in, in all ways. Uh, but uh, it must be said that in some countries in Europe, and in Norway as well, uh, we, um, uh, the, the um, well, if you look at the immigrants, they are not the same as coming to the US, for example. And, and uh, economically, they are, <coughs> might be a larger burden than, let's say, in, in where the best and brightest go. So I, I think the, the, uh, there, the, there is a, a, a mix of measures, both in, uh, in North Africa, uh, helping those people getting out on the water, but I think it's unlikely that we are willing to do what you encourage us to do, to open up the borders. Uh, I don't think that's the viable option today, politically. Okay, Jan-Erik? Yes, I think um, uh, if you look at the economic figures, um, countries with open borders and high immigration fare quite well, economically speaking. But it's also in these countries where you have strong political opposition. It's amazing to see how right-wing populist, um, quite hardline parties grew in the European Parliament election last year in Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, Austria and the UK, all doing quite well, in fact, amongst the best economies of Europe. So, so that's uh, mm -hmm. interesting how probably then welfare societies, uh, high-growing societies fear immigrants, even though it's, I think, like you say, immigrants um, boost the economy. 
Thank you. I think we will have the questions now, and I probably have enough of you on the list already. So uh, <laughs> if they are really short, maybe I'll have a time for some more questions, but I'll tell you the list is closed. Uh, Lars Pede Nordbakken. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I think uh, Ray's books, uh, book is one of the most hopeful books about Europe, written during the last years. It's uh, really a hopeful and critical book at the same time, I think, through a collection there. Now, one of the great strengths of your book, I think, is that you are pointing in analyzing Europe. You're saying that uh, Europe is not only uh, facing a cyclical problem, it's a structural problem that goes very, very deep into the very dynamism of the economies. And um, on the other hand, of course, the dilemma, uh, w the political will and the ability to do something and to convince people that there really is a need to change seems to be nowhere, <laughs> seems to start nowhere. So. Uh, is that, uh, I would like to ask you, do you see any hopes that there is a political uh, awareness is growing to do something, uh, at least in the liberal parts of Europe? What's your comment about that? Okay, so the question is, do you see a political wellness of understanding the crisis and doing something politically in the liberal parts of Norway to the situation that we have? I mean, the understanding of the crisis and then the willingness to do something. I think that most political leaders in the moment in Europe are, are scared um, of making big decisions, um, of taking, um, making bold moves. They think that they'll be punished by voters uh, if they do, um, uh, and they don't have the courage of their own convictions, um, which is why, uh, I mean, perhaps there are politicians that I'm not aware of who are um, uh, making those, uh, who, are, who are saying those things. What I, at a senior level, certainly the ones that I met in my time at the European Commission, um, there weren't very many of them. So I think you need to have I mean, many more people going into politics um, who want to change things. I think we have a class of professional politicians who are good at managing things, or just about okay at managing things when there aren't big decisions to take, but when you do need to make big changes. You need people who have a vision uh, and people who have courage uh, and who are people who are willing to fight um, for change. And I think you know, the situation now uh, in Europe uh, calls for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we'll have the next question and you will be able to comment on that. Uh, that is the gentleman over there. Eric, uh, there's my name. First, just one quick uh, question regarding uh, immigrants. Are Europe, is Europe getting the immigrants that we need to deal with these problems in terms of skill levels, in terms of willingness to be <coughs> integrated into those countries in which, <coughs> to which they come? Or <coughs> is that <coughs> considered by you to be a problem? Then comes the more fundamental <coughs> question. It appears to be that to deal with all these problems, basically, you need a strong, decisive government that can take four, four steps. That at the European level. That to me points in more integration of social policies, of labor market policies, of fiscal policies, and so forth at the European level. In other words, a move toward the United States of Europe. And it appears in the real political world that the movement is going exactly in the <coughs> contrary direction. That, that is to say, you, in, in your own country now, you, you want a looser union with more national autonomy. That to me po seems to pose a big fundamental question that, <coughs> that does not make me very optimistic, quite frankly, about the future ahead. Thank you very much. We have two questions. One, are we getting the immigrants that we uh, are searching for, I mean, with skills and knowledge? And the other one is quite fundamental. If you are looking for a strong government, European government, uh, for instance, the elections in the UK now uh, makes us wonder what is going to happen uh, when the uh, Brits are going to vote yes or no for the EU before 2017. So maybe you might just also put a comment to this fundamental question on the elections in the UK. And you may also comment on that. You start, Mr. Legrain. Well, I think Europe needs uh, all sorts of uh, different migrants and that 
um, governments aren't best placed to decide um, uh, who um, they need. Um, I think that if you had a more sensible migration policy, for example, like Sweden, <coughs> previous government brought in, where companies can hire workers at any skill level from anywhere in the world uh, on two-year renewable visas, that you would be, mm -hmm. companies would be able to attract the workers that they need. Mm -hmm. Second of all, you need to make better use of the people who are already there. Um, there is a kind of view, for example, that accepting refugees is an act of charity. It is, but it's also, they also have a lot to contribute. Um, you know, the, the, the <coughs> refugees who make it to Europe are often um, the most uh, talented uh, and uh, highly skilled ones, um, uh, and uh, their children even more so. And there's a tendency to treat them uh, as if um, once they've got here, you don't expect any of them. And I think that's harmful for their personal development, and it's also harmful for society because they get treated as a burden rather than something to contribute. And I think that attitude needs to change. It's prevalent in the Nordic countries of seeing, you know, w aren't we good people? We're allowing people in as refugees. Yes, you are good people, but also once they get here, make good use of, uh, of their talents. Um, uh, in terms of... Um, EU integration. I think it's quite funny in Norway being criticised that Britain isn't committed enough to Europe when you're not even <laughs> in Europe at all. <laughs> but, um, well, I'll let that pass. <laughs> uh, you're right, there is, going to be, there is going to be now a referendum uh, on Britain's membership of the EU uh, in, in <coughs> 2017. Uh, it's going to be a hard-fought referendum. Uh, uh, I suspect that uh, it's going to divide uh, the Conservative Party, that it's going to be difficult to, uh, to win. Uh, I would say it's probably a slightly more than 50% chance that Britain will stay in, but lot, lots can happen between, um, uh, then, uh, between now and then. Uh, and a lot of it depends on how, how well the Eurozone is doing and whether Europe seems like something attractive that you want to be a part of. In terms of whether more integration is possible, I don't think it is at the moment, because um, uh, even before the crisis, um, there, was, uh, there wasn't enough support to move forward with close integration. As a result of the crisis, these new grievances and tensions have been created. People don't trust each other anymore. Uh, and the idea that you could solve all that by leaping to a European government, uh, I think, is actually uh, dangerous. The idea that Greece and Germany could be run by the same uh, government, I think, is a bit crazy. Uh, I think you, you could just follow up on that because in your book you wrote about the Euro and the Eurozone and the three possible futures for the Eurozone mm -hmm. where a Germanic Eurozone was one technocratic one and then the federal was the other alternative and the last one was the flexible one which is a little bit about this uh, sovereignty that we are talking about. You might just fit in a comment for that as well. Sure. I mean, you're absolutely right that, you know, as, as, as an economist I will tell you it makes much more sense to have a federal eurozone. You know, we know that federalism works well as an economic system. It works in Germany, it works in the United States, it works in Switzerland. So, you know, or an economist or a political economist, uh, except that uh, you know there isn't um, uh, the political support for it. Um, so, how then could you make the eurozone work well without creating uh, a common fiscal authority? And I argue you ought to go back to a more decentralised, flexible uh, eurozone, which means um, uh, restoring the autonomy that. Uh, governments have uh, over fiscal policy, along with the no bailout rule, which was breached in 2010, with two crucial differences. One, um, you need a, a mechanism for dealing with financial panics, and secondly, you need a mechanism for dealing with sovereign default, and we don't have uh, those, well, at least the last one. Okay, uh, Green Time, you'd like a comment? Yes, well, there was one question about the uh, immigrants. Do we get the immigrants we need? I, I, I see your point, but I, I think that's one of the good things about Europe, we don't ask whether we need you or not. We open our arms and we say, you're welcome. And I think that's, uh, that equality, that all people are equal, is a very important uh, thing in a democracy. The, the second point is, uh, Philip, you said uh, the politicians are punished by, by voters. I don't think political opposition is a sign of crisis. It's a sign of a well-functioning democracy. I think it's good that we have opposition in Europe. And I think when we see these um, people opposing the system as such, it's a good thing. It, it shows that Europe is a democratic political institution. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a next yeah, question yeah. over here. Hi, Jenna from the Conservative Party. Um, you're, you're having questions now on migration from different angles. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you still think of migration as a solution to, uh, uh, to the aging population, but how to deal with the large scale immigration we see 
uh, of unskilled laborers. Uh, you have commented a bit on that, but you have the housing, jobs, integration, language. And, and in Norway, housing is, is a, a great problem because you can't just live on the street in minus 20 degrees. Um, and you also say that a lot of the, the immigrants that are coming do have a high level of education. I know people, we have people in the, uh, the party that are Syrians that are trained as dentists, but as a Syrian dentist, you have a totally different uh, training than as a Norwegian dentist. You cannot use your skills here unless you take the education once more. Um, and how do you see that with the technology, the technology shift that, um, where they say that we will lose 40% of the jobs today, we will lose in 10 to 20 years. And for Mr. Andreessen, uh, the brain wanted a shift from taxing hard work and companies to taxing property and inheritance. Um, so we know about the property debate and taxing on that. But this government they um, has removed the inher inheritance tax and even the Labour Party says that they won't reintroduce it as they saw that it didn't make a, a huge difference on the budget and it targeted uh, the wrong people. Do you think, and you, you it looked like you agreed with him. Do you, uh, do you think that um, Norway has a population of inherited rich that could make an impact on the budget and that we could reintroduce uh, inheritance tax? And please don't interpret this as anything. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, how? <laughs> okay, there were two questions, uh, starting with the immigrants and uh, saying that uh, they might come as unskilled or even you might have skilled immigrants being a dentist, a Syrian dentist, but you cannot use your education in Norway or in any other European country. Uh, what will that, uh, what will that uh, make when you have also a labor changing market that will probably make it even harder for unskilled workers to, to get uh, work? And the other one is taxing questions that you are writing about in your book taxing properties and taxing inheritance. And the specific question here is, do we have enough rich people to reintroduce the inheritance tax in Norway or, well, anywhere in Europe? I guess your <coughs> proposition here is for the European taxing system. And you also might sign up for comments. Um, well, you asked rather a lot of questions uh, about <laughs> immigration. Um, I think that uh, you, you pointed to a genuine problem, which is, in some cases, migrants have valuable skills and those qualifications are recognized uh, in, that in, in, in this country. Uh, and then clearly that ought to be um, a focus for government action, uh, that in order to make use, best use of the people who are here, um, that they can do uh, courses to enable them to quickly um, achieve um, a Nor Norwegian qualification, uh, enabling them to practice here. Uh, and it is a waste of their skills and indeed, um, uh, uh, bad for Norway if they're reduced to uh, driving taxis instead. Though even then it might be a rational individual decision if they think that's a means of achieving a better life um, uh, for their children. But I think it's also a mistake to think that we only need skilled workers. That's just not true. I mean, you see countries that only um, uh, let in skilled workers. Canada's a very good example. And you see this co consistent de-skilling of people because actually um, there is a demand for unskilled work too. And put simply, you know, um, Norwegians with higher education levels or higher aspirations or simply um, uh, aren't willing to do um, increasing numbers uh, of difficult jobs. And the biggest one of that is the fastest growing area of employment growth in Europe uh, is care for the elderly. And that's only going to get bigger. I mean, you look at the numbers of over 80s and people who are most, li most likely to need care, the numbers are going to soar. Uh, and yes, you could go the Japanese model and have old people cared for by a robot. I don't think that's an, uh, uh, an attractive <laughs> option for, for most people. Yes, you can open care homes in Spain. I know, know Norway's done a bit of that. Um, and that's nice life, but also you're far away from your family. So I think a key part of it actually um, uh, is having uh, care workers here in Nor Norway. And in terms of um, shifting, <coughs> no, no, nobody likes paying tax, um, but there are taxes which um, are, are harm things that we think are good, uh, like hard work uh, and enterprise, uh, and there are taxes um, which uh, reduce things that we think are bad, um, uh, like pollution. And then there are taxes like uh, taxes on land, which is an ideal tax because land increases in value not through the effort of the person who owns it, uh, but um, uh, through 
um, the growth of society as of a whole and the investment of the government uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and therefore, in order to pay for lower taxes uh, on work, in order to pay for lower taxes on enterprise, and therefore in order to make everyone else richer, shifting the burden of taxation uh, onto land is the ideal tax. Adam Smith said it, David Ricardo said it, um, it, 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 Winston Churchill said it. Um, uh, it, it, it it's, it's the ideal tax, uh, and it's the way of paying for, as I said, uh, lower taxes on labor and lower taxes on enterprise. Thank you. Uh, any others? Yeah, um, you have Andreasen? On, um, on property taxes in, in both US and UK, you have a much higher level of property taxes than we have in Norway. Well, I just wanted to provoke you on the property taxes and, uh, and inheritance tax. <laughs> uh, I don't have a program for the latter one, um, but we, we in, in many countries have taxes <coughs> on estate, estate taxes or inheritance tax. And I think it's, it's although one of those taxes that really don't harm the economy much. So I think that's the reason for, for having it. The reason why it failed was that we, didn't, we were not able or willing to put a real value on those assets that people had, and it was unfair, um, much like the wealth tax we have in Norway today. Uh, but if, if I cleaned up that first, I think there could be a, um, an argument for having, um, at a moderate level, an inherent tax in Norway as well. Thank I come you. back to the economic yes. things afterwards. I'll just like to, to make a comment. I think we, all, we still have an inheritance tax, but it doesn't work like it did. So uh, it is better uh, now. But the system is complicated, but it's much no, working much better. I said, a, I said a tax on large inheritances. <coughs> Do we have it? It's, it's not, isn't it abolished totally? Uh, it, is about, it. It, it is about it's the value of the property that you are leaving from one generation to the other. It's much better now. So you are getting taxed, but when you sell things. So, uh, but yeah. you don't have a tax when you die. It, no, it no. doesn't, no. <laughs> but when you sell it, you have. <laughs> well, uh, Mark, Mark Twain once said, buy land, they don't make it anymore. <laughs> so I think that's... Uh, <laughs> but they, we, they made like, quite a lot of it. <laughs> yes, but, but I think if you, if you, if you need the money, uh, Heidi, you should... Uh, t I, I agree you shouldn't tax hard uh, work, but uh, you need to tax people if you, if you need the money to, to run the welfare yeah. state. I think, yeah. Okay, I think we have one last question, and that's here. I would like to address a question con uh, concerned with uh, the increasing separatism in, in Europe. And you remarked, uh, Philippe uh, de Brain, that, um, well, I, I interpreted that you uh, described increased separatism as something, a negative feature in the European picture. But when you look at the European uh, integration project, to a certain extent there is some logic to it because you have, you have strengthened the supranational level and increased the local or regional levels. So my question is, is it necessarily a negative thing, the increasing um, fight for uh, more autonomous regions in this context? Because it could somehow stimulate maybe what you're looking for, the, the a new political groups, new people, new ideas, maybe dismantling the, 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 the rigidities of the national state and all those structures? That's a, that's a very good question. Yes, uh, shall I probably repeat it first? So you'll, uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's uh, increased separatism and uh, you'll see it's probably seen as something negative. And the question here is, could it be positive making, uh, making people participating democratically by showing, uh, showing interest in their own region? And could that stimulate to something? So, uh, you know, Lorraine, you can answer that. <coughs> Clearly, um, it can be I go either way. Uh, what I was saying is it was symptomatic of the increasing uh, social tensions and political frictions uh, that exist. Um, so if you go to Scotland, a lot of the movement for Scottish independence is based on resentment of the English. And likewise, you go to Catalonia, you go to Barcelona, and it's resentment of, of, of Madrid, resentment of uh, politicians in Madrid. So I would say it was symptomatic of increasing social tensions and, and political frictions. Now, um, I respect um, uh, the right uh, of uh, national groups to seek uh, 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 independence. Um, and uh, clearly, throughout history, um, we've seen an increase in the number uh, of nation states. Um, I fear, though, um, that uh, the new nation states that would be created 
uh, would be uh, inward-looking uh, ones uh, rather than outward-looking ones. If you go, and I know Catalonia quite well, you go to Barcelona at the moment, uh, and the idea is not so much um, uh, that we're going to be independent and open up to the world, it's that we're the best, we don't need Spain, and we're going to turn inwards. And if you look at Scotland at the moment, uh, there is a feeling um, uh, that uh, also of turning inwards. So I think if you said to me this was part of um, we're trying to break out from a big country where we don't feel our voices listened to, and what emerges from that uh, is a confident, positive nation that wants to contribute to the world, I'd say, yeah, that's fantastic. If, on the contrary, it is a symptom of, you know, we are angry um, with um, uh, the way that our affairs are run, we're blaming it all uh, on foreigners or on the people in London uh, or in Madrid, and we're going to elect a bunch of politicians um, who aren't necessarily going to be open and outward looking, then I think it's different. Now, but, you know, of course, I mean, Norway's history shows very well. One can split away from a larger country and turn into a thriving democracy. So, um, uh, and likewise, <coughs> Ireland from Britain. So uh, it, it can go either way. Thank you. I think I look at the watch here and some knowing Mr. Grindheim is leaving us shortly, but I think we'll have three more comments or questions. So if you'll be really brief, just formulate your questions. We'll take those three and we'll sum up by having your comments. So first, it's you. Yeah. Having come from the European Union, I'd like to stay there, and I'm British, as you can hear as well. So this is a debate I've heard many times here, too, from the way of Britain and Norway, but he's on the European Union. So just to say the EU European debate, I think, is alive and kicking here. But to be brief, um, my question was actually to come back to the issue of trade. You touched, touched on trade. TTIP is much on the agenda here, and I'd like to hear very briefly your uh, comments on that in the current context. Okay, and the next question is over there. Uh, my name is Fakhra Salimi, and I'm working with the Mira Center. It's a resource center for migrant women. And I, I think I would first like to say something about migration in Norway. Like, I mean, Norwegian welfare state is built on the migration, migrant labor, because Norwegian uh, 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 migrants were imported uh, to Norway to build uh, the state at that time. And I think if you look out, the people who are working on the street right now, 99% of those workers are migrants, migrants from Europe and other parts of the world. So I think that migrants are doing a very enormous contribution in this country. The problem is that we are talking about um, uh, migrants, skilled migrants coming and not getting jobs, but there are so many migrant kids, young people who are engineers and doctors today who are not getting the proper jobs here, there is lots of discrimination and racism in the labor market, and that has to be addressed, this thing. Uh, secondly, I would like to ask, thank you very much for a very nice presentation and analysis about Europe, that Europe is also seeking markets uh, abroad, and uh, there they want to have freedom and uh, openness from Asia, from Africa, South America, but why is this so much skepticism of Europe when the others want to have that kind of open access to Europe uh, and European markets? Thank, Thank you. you. And the last question, you may just be very short, it's over there. Me? Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Hans Erik Ulo. Uh, I would first like to say uh, thank you for a very nice uh, speech. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you're speaking to the choir. Europe is absolutely broke, morally, socially, politically, economically. <laughs> uh, Can you formulate a question, please? Yes, I will. Uh, I would like to. I would like to ask you, since I don't have much time, I'd just like to ask you to go to the root to the problem as I see it, and that is the role of government. Too much centralized government, uh, too much bureaucracy. Uh, the only way we can get the, get things in order is to actually reduce it. Can you? Give me your opinion about that. Thank you. Uh, then the three questions are uh, quickly summed up like first, trade, then the second, uh, get proper jobs when you have qualifications for my grants, and the third thing is centralized government and bureaucracies. Uh, I ask Grindheim first to comment on those things that you'd like to comment, and then for both of you to prepare your last statements, um, including the comments that you'd like to make on the questions. Mr. Grindheim. Yes. Will I also have my final comment? Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, well, I think the first question on trade, 
I think um, TTIP is a very good idea. I strongly believe in this uh, agreement between the US and, and Europe because it's a, a very broad and deep agreement. It's a partnership. Uh, we are, um, have mutual recognition of, of standards and so on. So that's a very good thing. Secondly, qualification. I think one of the problems, uh, it's not only when you come from Syria that you have to re-qualify in Norway. When you come from Denmark and Sweden, you have to. So, so uh, we have a problem of uh, accepting other people's education in this country. Centralized government. Well, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, but of course, you should always be skeptical to, to centralized government and, and power. That's, uh, that's about democracy. Um, so, um, well, my final comment is that I hope your book will sell well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think the Sorry, publicity <laughs> is really made here, so uh, you'll sell a couple of books here, Mr. Lagrain. Uh, 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 and I also agree that com complacency and vested interest is, is a lethal combination, and um, uh, it's against change. I love Europe, and I love Europe to change to, to stay Europe. <laughs> but I think we should <coughs> stop being so masochistic about ourselves, because I think we have a quite good model of society a good political culture. And I think what we see in the, in, in the Mediterranean, the way the Italians, after all, have tackled the huge problems uh, we have seen has been very, very good. I think we need to help Italy. So that's my final comment. Thank you very much. Then uh, Mr. Andrea. Well, uh, short answers to the questions. Uh, I like trade. I like the system to integrate mig immigrants to the economy. And I agree with you that there are large proportion of the uh, immigrants are contributing of course, to Thank the economy. Um, then my, my final comment. I think uh, I st my starting point was quite simple. If you look at the figures, they're not that bad. GDP per capita in, work, in working age uh, in Europe rose faster than the US until the mid 80s and in line with the, with the US after, after that time. And we have a, a much better development, in fact, on the labor market in Europe of the previous 10, 15, 20 years than the US. The, uh, the participation rate has been declining in the US and it's now quite low. In Europe, it is, it's higher. Of course, some problems are struggling because they made so many stupid decisions and helped by bankers in other countries, like Germany and France and others, uh, moving or uh, killing those economies with wasteful investments in construction. Disaster. And they are struggling, but the, the, that fight is behind us. And since growth has been okay, Look at corporate, corporate profits. I'm, that's my job, uh, at least my colleagues. Uh, <laughs> earnings per share has been doing perfectly all right in the European companies. They are not bad companies. They're not bragging in the same way as they do in the US, but still they are kicking the, kicking the, the stone and saying, oh, it's not good at all. And we, we, we complain as much as we believe it because we don't look at the figures. They're not that bad. Uh, average productivity has been slightly worse in Europe, but that has been compensated by a huge increase in participation in the labor market. So I think the starting point is not that bad. And the Eurozone has been able to change. All important, important part of the union has been changed since the crisis because the model they built before it was, was based on the assumption what, that, what happened couldn't happen. And when it happened, well, shit happens and they, and they changed the model. So the, the stability fund, banking union, everything, was established. I think Europe needs change, as all countries do over time. And, but Europe is changing, and not too much of that is based on policy. The, of course, really stupid economic policy, economic policy uh, systems are really bad. But take a, take a give of the, of the really stupid ones. In the middle, it doesn't matter that much. M much of this is based on entrepreneurship, on what businesses are doing, what people want to do. And we're not doing that bad. So with gradual changes, I, and I, well, I haven't decided, I, I can't I count your list on policy advices. Uh, I, I think I, I, I could vote yes for most of them, and I hope some of them will be, be um, implemented. But the major thing is that a gradual change could be sufficient even in Europe. It's not as bad as you said, Ulo. It's not. Look at the figures. Thank you very much. And then uh, your final comment, Mr. Legrain. Well, I have looked at the figures, and there are <laughs> even more in them in this book than I mentioned in my speech. And I think the figures are actually um, the worse than you say. And by aligning the 1980s <laughs> with post-1995, you're mixing up a period when Europe was oh, doing well, with, well. A, with, with a period when Europe is doing um, less well. And I think the Eurozone performance has been truly catastrophic. In fact, you, know, you can just look at the evidence. It's the worst performance of anywhere since the 1930s, and in some cases, worse than the 1930s. 
Uh, in terms of trade, which is a very important question, I mean, I used to work as special advisor to the Director General of the World Trade Organization. I'm a multilateralist um, by inclination. I think that global free trade is better than regional free trade. Um, that said, um, a free trade agreement with um, the United States is better than nothing, um, uh, and therefore that we should be pursuing it. I am not particularly optimistic about the likelihood of concluding it. First of all, because I'm a very, very clearly when we launched the negotiations, it was a time when there was no growth in Europe and we were looking for a way of having some good news that didn't cost us anything. So we said, oh, well, you know, uh, and, the, and the US agreed to, to launch the, the, the TTIP negotiations. But very rapidly, it became clear that the United States was not that interested in TTIP. And you just need to go to Washington. You, you even speak to people in Congress they don't even know that TTIP actually is going on. Um, which tells you that the chances of um, uh, having the political momentum to conclude it on the US side is quite low. Um, on the EU side, we've seen that you know, a, a whole range of people have started to oppose it for all sorts of reasons, whether it is you know, the investor state um, dispute settlement, whether it is fears that it's going to lead us to have um, you know, dangerous American food or uh, a lowering of, of regulations. And I think on the European side, there's more skepticism than before too. And if you think the next year is an election year and therefore we don't get it done this year, it won't, it'll be put back till you know, uh, 2017 uh, or 2018, uh, I would say that um, the prospects for TTIP um, are not particularly good uh, in the short term. Um, uh, the lady talking about the contribution of, of, of migrants. I, I'm sure you're right to say that there is discrimination against uh, migrants in the labor market. I think it's also the way that labor market institutions work, i.e. if you have a labor market which favors insiders at the expense of outsiders, uh, then outsiders, whether they are young people uh, or um, uh, migrants, uh, tend to do badly. Uh, and that is true uh, even if there is no discrimination uh, at, at all. And therefore, I think that having labor markets that are open to everyone uh, uh, I is uh, important. And in terms of uh, the role of government and bureaucracy, I think mean, uh, clearly government can play uh, a positive role uh, and a negative role. Uh, uh, people have different views about uh, the appropriate size of government. By my standards, I find the Norwegian government rather large, um, uh, but, uh, and the taxes here rather high. Um, but if you're part of it and you are a beneficiary of the spending that it um, uh, provides, then perhaps you might, might have a different view. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll give an applause to the panel.